Other, the other side of the topic is just good old digestive health, and that's the upper part. So that's the indigestion and the reflux and these problems, which the reason I wanted to talk about that is because it's something that um, someone very close to me has suffered from for quite a long time. Um, I believe a lot of it is to do with lifestyle, um, but it's not an unhealthy lifestyle. Well, I mean, it is if it's causing this problem, but it's something that we see obviously as a good lifestyle, which is obviously a bodybuilding lifestyle. Um, and it's definitely something that I know, just you know, talking to people in the industry, and when I say the industry, I mean the bodybuilding industry, where it is a more and more common thing where people are saying, oh gosh, I have so much problem digesting food, I have reflux, I have, you know, I, I have issues with, all kind of digestive issues, you know, either food moving through too fast, food moving through not quick enough. Um, and of course that impacts the ability to train. It impacts the ability to get the calories in that people need. It impacts the ability to grow. It just impacts quality of life because even the ability to sleep. So anything that impacts your ability to sleep, it flows on, it flows on. You get where I'm going. Um, so yeah, definitely in the last five to 10 years, um, I've, I've seen this something really surge up, this digestive problems. Um, compared to when I was first in the industry, say, 30 years ago. Now, I will talk about what I believe that is to do with, but I'm just going to kind of talk first about what, you know, the digestive problems. Now, I did a bit of research, and um, so reflux, um, which I think they is, is essentially, um, you know, where the acid and food is coming back up um, and not being contained in the stomach. And then indigestion is just more commonly like um, just, you know, discomfort from... In, you know, from eating different types of foods. And it's the the rate is anywhere from like 30% of the actual reflux up to about 70% for indigestion. So majority of the population is suffering from this at one point in, of time and another. Uh, Australia is definitely on the lower end uh, compared to some of the countries in the world, uh, which I think is a great thing. Uh, and, I, and I will definitely attest to this because I remember when I first started traveling to the States in early 2000, walking into um, a drugstore and there's like literally a whole aisle dedicated to indigestion products and in Australia we kind of have like quickies and maybe some Mylanta and a couple of other little sections but yeah America um, you know and, and anyone who's been to America can probably understand how it is linked to volume of food type of food um, which I will talk about uh, but yeah just just going to say that is obviously the dietary impact is massive um, but then the impact on um, it being a problem like a modern, a modern disease uh, and something that we really don't need to live with now, um, the thing with indigestion is it can be a sign of something else going on, like irritable bowel. It can be a sign of, of some form of cancer, gallbladder cancer, um, but most commonly it is associated with reflux or the um, gast gastroesophageal reflux uh, disorder, which essentially is, um, there's a whole lot of different forms of it, and I'm not gonna go into the technical detail on that, but the most common one obviously is where there's a little valve at the top of our stomach, which essentially, once you swallow the food down, it blocks it off because it's one way and it doesn't let that food come back up again. Now, if that valve gets damaged or weakened, um, then that will allow food to come back up or if there is just far too much food in the stomach, it, something's going to give and it's going to come back up again. So um, with um, just with, with that, sorry, I've lost my place here, what I wanted to say. Um, you know, as I said, it's, a lot of it is associated with you know, bad food choices, high fat diets, a lot of alcohol, uh, spicy food and all things like that. But the fact that it's happening more and more in the bodybuilding community where we are eating low fat diets, uh, where we are eating more healthier foods, um, that's what's kind of sparked my interest in this and, and why that is actually happen happening. Um, so I don't believe it's necessarily always to do with poor nutrition, but it is definitely also associated with, you know, types of supplements we might be taking and the volume of food. So um, just, yeah, in, in terms of the symptoms, I don't know if I need to really go into that. We've all probably suffered indigestion where it's anything from that little bit of acidic kind of a feeling in the back of the throat um, to more like a burning chest pain or even that feeling that something's kind of stuck and just won't go down. Uh, and I know I used to suffer a lot more when I actually ate a very low fat diet. Um, and that's what I believe that we don't talk about that, but the extremely high fat diets can cause it. But I think also when food is so dry, when it's like tuna and rice or dry boiled chicken and rice, that that lack of fat to kind of moisten and lubricate food can also have a really, really big impact there. So um, so without further ado, I'm going to look at some of the main causes of it. Now, I've been alluding to like the issue with bodybuilders um, and large portions is, see to me, like the number one. So 
when you're trying to gain weight, when you're trying to gain muscle, you have to eat a lot of food. And it's nothing for, you know, very large, like, you know, 300, 400 grams of a protein at any one time being consumed. Now, that plus some rice, uh, it all forms a very, very large amount of food. And you put that into your stomach and it does take about two and a half to three hours for a 50% clearance of the stomach and up to five hours for a 100% clearance. So you think about it, you're eating that meal uh, and a lot of bodybuilders have to eat every three hours to get all the calories in that they consume. So if you're only half digested and you're putting another meal in on the top of that, now you've got like one and a half meals in there. And then it's like a whole bunch of different chemicals have got to start being um, sent out to deal with that food and the original meal is at a different part of the process. So then you kind of got, I guess, um, you know, you're, you're overworking your stomach in terms of what it's having to put out. Uh, and then it's, you know, and, and whether the signals are getting crossed up or who knows what, but it's definitely causing that problem of, of the stomach filling and the stomach filling. And there's a potential that, you know, that, that valve just isn't going to be able to take it and you're essentially force feeding, but that food is just saying, nah, I wanna come back up again. So doesn't matter the type of food there, it really does come down to the volume. Our stomach's about a liter and it can stretch up to about four. And I guess the more you eat, the more you can stretch it. But that constantly doing that or constantly forcing that valve the wrong way is definitely gonna weaken it over time. So it just makes total sense that that's gonna be an issue. Now, um, you know, how do you get around that with bodybuilding? Obviously there's more concentrated forms of food. You don't have to eat 300 400 grams of meat to get what you need you can do protein shakes um, at some of those meals which are going to take up a, a way smaller volume for that same amount of protein um, so there's there's different ways around that but unfortunately i think you know if you're going to grow then that is going to be a problem that you're going to have where you are going to be eating meals very close together and maybe not giving your body that chance to to um to move it on um so that but that that's as i said that's to do with large portion obviously on sedentary people or people who don't exercise it's also associated with being overweight um so therefore people eating more than what they need or eating you know the type of food that they shouldn't be but i'm talking more about people here who do exercise already uh and who are eating a clean diet and why that's still happening um now with um with yeah and obviously then the type of food as well because if you're eating a lot of steak and a lot of meats like that which are very slow to, slow to digest and again bodybuilders love to eat steak because of the you know the high protein and the high iron and all those really great things um but the the problem there is that it's going to cause that same problem so you know an idea might be to look at mixing it up and having less steak with something a little bit quicker to digest it like fish or or even your chicken or egg whites so that you're not getting all of your protein from that one protein source and trying to like mix that up throughout the day um and I think I've kind of jumped ahead to the solution as well, but obviously including fiber. So fiber, um, we talked about in terms of being a food for the gut, but it's also that, as I said, that thing that moves things through. So if you're eating a diet that's really high in protein um, and maybe carbohydrates that are devoid of fiber, because you're trying to, because you think to yourself, if I eat the fibrous ones, I'm going to fill myself up too much and I'm not going to be able to fit this all in and I won't be able to eat the calories that I need. Um, but the truth is that that actually allows it to all pass through at the rate that it should so that your body's not kind of getting stuck and getting backed up with food so um, when you're having your protein maybe do consider having fiber as some type of supplement or even within your diet um, just to kind of keep that broken up and keep that moving so that you're not overstressing your stomach so that's one of the one of the issues um, eating too fast now again we probably all notice that once you when you try to like smash a meal down and you're in a hurry and then you kind of like you suffer for it um, again this comes back to having to eat the meals too frequently um, you're rushing for a training session um, you know you, whatever reason um, you might be you know eating too fast now what also happens with that is that every time we swallow we do take in air um, and that that is and that is one of the issues with indigestion is that air getting trapped um, in the esophagus and that's like the more that you're eating quick the more you're kind of gulping and taking that air in um, and that is going to cause that problem so you know think about your meal give yourself plenty of time to eat that meal um, maybe don't may, and this might sound a little bit silly too but don't try like try not to talk while you're eating and I know a lot of people you like to have a conversation um, but I think that that is going to add to that problem so maybe just kind of focus on your meal eat your meal chew it really really properly because again if you're putting less mechanically broken up food into your stomach you've got more work that the stomach needs to do and therefore you've got more of a problem of potentially it's going to come back up so you know chewing slowly eating more slowly 
um, or giving yourself that time to consume that food is probably a really good idea to, to avoid that kind of issue with your um, indigestion. Um, again, certain foods, so we talk about, you know, they say citric, citrus foods, tomatoes, um, you know, oranges, um, yeah, they say peppermint. Peppermint can be soothing, but it also apparently aggravates indigestion. Um, these are things like chocolate. These are all things which kind of play havoc with indigestion. And this is where I'm going to throw in um, pre-workouts because uh, this is a, this is one thing which I've really seen creep in to the bodybuilding world. You know, in the last ten, probably even fifteen years. But again, they were not in existence when I first started training. Nobody knew what a pre-workout was. It was a cup of coffee. Um, then the early day ones came along, and they were like arginine creatine and beta alanine so none of those are particularly um acidic in any way and then a citrulline started to get added as a malate which is a, basically acid and now um, a lot of the ingredients that are going in are very very acidic and if not the active ingredients the actual um to to get them to taste right because we all hate the way all of that stuff tastes so people want them to taste really good and there's a lot of acid in those products so you think about it, you go for a training session, you drink your pre-workout, and a lot of people drink the pre-workout as they go. So you're constantly putting that acidic food into your stomach. You may or may not have had something else, so it could be potentially on a fairly empty stomach. Um, but also the acidity and that constant acid on the valve can weaken that valve. So therefore you're gonna have weakened valve, pressure from the food coming up the wrong way because you're eating too much um, or, you know, or eating a big volume of food. Um, and you, so you've got a weaker valve and more pressure. So again, something's going to give and that's what the, the result is going to be. Um, there's also that problem where you see people deciding that they're just going to dump a dry scoop of pre-workout into their mouth, which is probably the worst, absolute worst thing that you could do for yourself because you're literally putting acid um, all the way down um, your, esoph your esophagus drink water but stuff takes time to dissolve so you're kind of like literally dissolving acid into your esophagus and onto that valve so um that's not something that i would ever do i don't ever recommend doing it um but just kind of keep that in mind if you do see someone doing it please tell them to stop um because they are not doing themselves any favors whatsoever with that so um again you know there has to be a reason why this is cropping up more and more in our community um, and that i believe is one of the reasons for it um, just going on, obviously stress, we've talked about that with other gut health, the same moves across here, stress, anxiety, everything kind of tightening up, all of that does, you know, lead to you know, different forms of um, heartburn and indigestion, um, being overweight, smoking, being pregnant, unfortunately, that is part of pregnancy. I think most people, most women who've been pregnant, I've never had kids, but um, I, everyone that I've spoken to who does always says how you know, the, their um, digestion is impacted. And that is actually, uh, I don't, I didn't read into why, but I just know that um, that is one of the factors which is going to impact on that. So that's something that is there. Um, but if you can eat better and, and apply some of the things to stop indigestion, then you're going to have a, a better ride as such. Um, the other things are eating close to bedtime and the position that you're in. So obviously, have you ever noticed that um, if you eat and then you try to lay down, everything kind of comes feels like it's coming straight back up so there you've basically just got physics working against you so if you've already got a full stomach and a slightly weakened valve and then you go and lay down you're just doing everything wrong for your body so you really need to keep those things in mind that it's also the physical positioning if you stay upright you can keep everything staying down so even if you have all of those problems as much as it might suck and you just want to go to sleep because you've just eaten that last meal and you're still half asleep you need to take that time to let it settle um, or at least very least try to sit up in bed or something so if you are suffering really badly from that um, just changing your physical position position um, going for a little bit of a walk letting things settle um, can have a massive impact on on letting that um, all kind of come down um, and then finally medication so things like aspirin and anti-inflammatories can obviously also impact that so everybody knows not to take their voltaren on an empty stomach um, because it does do bad stuff for your gut and um, can cause all kind of ulcers and things because it's basically eating away at the lining of your stomach and and that so um, again that's very very important and again it is something which we probably are um, using more frequently because we more often than not are suffering some kind of um, you know injury or niggle or something so we do tend to use those kind of products so um, that's just some of the you know the causes and um, then just you know I've talked about it a little bit but I'm going to say like the best way to alleviate some of these problems uh, as I said I kind of talked about that as we went so I'm going a little bit out of order here but obviously you know eating smaller meals again it's obvious it's common sense but how do you do that if you are if you have to get those calories in 
what do you do? Because it's easy for me to say, go eat a smaller meal. But if someone's trying to eat whatever level of calories and they have to do that, then there's got to be a way. So as I'm saying, like, look at easier to, to digest um, proteins in particular. So uh, we all know, well, you know, we all should know that proteins do digest at different rates. Um, so pick one which will digest quicker so you are clearing it out um, quicker. Um, use that fiber even though it does fill you up but use it in a supplemental way which maybe doesn't make you feel as bulked um as you as you have it like for example if you take some metamucil and you don't allow it to thicken and you were to drink that you're not going to necessarily feel as full as if you kind of let it all swell up um it will swell up in your stomach um but it's just that little bit of a difference as to what form it actually goes in um but um you know this is something where it's a lot of a lot of trial and error but you got to be patient because this is something that um it, it will eventually improve, but you just have to be patient and you have to be willing to kind of try different things and find the point where, um, you know, your body, what it will accept and what it won't accept um, if you are committed to making it better. Because I think the, the benefit far out, outweighs maybe the annoyance of, of having to be a little bit finicky and fiddly with trying different foods and seeing what digests better and what, what quantities work for you. Maybe it does mean doing a 10 minute walk after every meal um, just to allow things to settle. Um, and maybe it is, you know, not eating dairy products before you go to sleep because you might find that that plays up with you or don't eat um, you know Italian herbs and you don't have a nice meat pasta sauce because you know that that plays up with you it's a matter of really paying attention to what gives what and um, trying to stay away from that so um, as I said you know the, the timing that it takes to clear the stomach um, you have to keep that in mind when you are planning out your meals um, and you know being mindful that you know it is that kind of up to four to five hours to really totally empty your stomach at about you know two and a half to three hours to 50 percent empty your stomach and your intestine so they're kind of working one in one so the same thing if one's not clearing the other one's got nowhere to go and then it um you know obviously causes the problems all the way up there um and then i um yeah just you know, I talked about how I find exercise really helps to kind of move it all through. Um, there's another really well-known um, professional bodyboarder who always says, you know, he does cardio to keep the food moving. Um, and that, you know, is, is something if you're not doing cardio because you feel like you don't need to do it to lose weight. Um, and while you think, oh, I might need to eat more food because now I'm doing cardio, but I think that that, um, that constant balance of giving your body a reason to replenish and to pull the food through is, is um, something not to be overlooked um the um yeah so the it, i talked about you know not swallowing too much air with your food but if you do and if you find that that's a really big problem um and it's something that can kind of it's too late once you notice it like it's too late once you've eaten and the air's in there and it's not coming up and you may actually need to go like resort to the physical expulsion of that air so you know how you burp a baby because they can't really do that and you know you burp them and you know, stuff comes up um it's really the same thing with people who have that chronic issue of the air getting trapped you might have to actually um you know push on their back or push on their front to actually literally force that air out so um unfortunately it's not the most pleasant thing but it's something that just needs to be done um if you are suffering from that until you can get get the um condition back into a state of control and become more aware of what you're actually doing there um again um that that's you know one of the things there but avoiding high acid foods we talked about that with the pre-workouts um just coming back to that may 